that football group is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, we're going team by team. I would be very careful about sling stuff. Am I going to get sued? Are we going legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson, live on YouTube. It's Wednesday morning. How you doing, Sam? How much of that do you think made the intro? You screaming, ah, me laughing at it. They give us a countdown yeah. to go live. And at two, I yelled, ah, you know, like, oh, no, we're going live. And I, you know, I'm not saying the countdown's off, but what if they were off by a little bit? I don't know if that came through. Yeah. Well, you don't know how much of a buffer they give you, right? The buffer. Whether it's actual right. real time or if it's like if I give you the countdown. He doesn't mess. Yeah, top, top you know, doesn't mess. If I give you the countdown plus or minus a second, then if they say something stupid, we've still, we're still good. Everybody loves mock drafts, Sam. Everybody loves them. We did our mock the other day. People loved it. People loved it. You can tell by the comments. They loved every move that we made. I don't think that's true. You said some of the, some of the comments were toxic. Well, I said, I, I went, look, I mean, the comments were toxic, which, and they were so toxic that it led me to, like, does every mock get this? Because, you know, it's a constant joke that every mock on Twitter or whatever, it's, ah, oh, worst mock ever, everyone's complaining, right? So I looked up the stock exchange. They did a post-combine podcast or post-free agency podcast, or post-free agency mock draft. Mock draft. Yes. I went looking at the comments of that, and they're distinctly less toxic than ours. Now... They haven't been around as long. Maybe they haven't found the most toxic people on YouTube the way we have. They have a good following, though. I think they're generally nicer. Mm. I mean, there was a reason why. Which leads me to think this is this is something we're creating in the people. <laughs> there was a reason why last year I had Trevor on the show for the uh, reasons for optimism for yeah, all 32 teams. He's an optimistic he's, person. He's the optimism guy. Right. I mean, this is bringing me around to the idea that this is probably my doing, you know? I have fostered an environment of hatred and toxicity. Perhaps. Yeah. But as long as there's a lot of those people, it's good, <laughs> right? It's what pays the bills, Sam, right? To toxicity. Eyeballs. Yeah. Eyeballs and ears. So uh, today, you don't want to talk about the quarterback thing. Well, you went on Monday. You're like, hey, let's not let's, – let's cut down the amount of time we talk quarterbacks. We're constantly talking quarterbacks. Uh, people would... complain. There's too much quarterback talk on the show. And then I'm like, hey, what, are you doing on, what do you want to do on Wednesday? And you're like, let's have a two-hour quarterback discussion on whether there's an evaluation problem and a development issue based off – was it Bucky Brooks' tweet? Yeah, I wanted 15 yeah. to 20 minutes. You didn't want 15 to 20 minutes. You wanted like a whole it show It was going to be that. the core of the show yeah. plus some mailbag. Right. But you don't want to talk about it. I just suggested that might look foolish juxtaposed with your Monday proclamation that the people complain too much about our quarterback talk. I was more specific on Monday. I was being more specific around like, let's not break down J.J. McCarthy's game and Caleb Williams and Drake. Let's not go through all the strengths and the weaknesses and why this guy or that guy. That was all I'm saying. Okay. So um, Bucky Brooks is asking if there's a QB evaluation and development problem. He is. No. Huh. That's it. Okay. But today we're going we're gonna to react to other mock drafts. Well, there's a few. So since we did our mock draft, there were several things that got thrown out into the ether. Number one, right after we kind of defended and praised our, our friend of the show, Chris Sims, for being like, look, I like his out there takes, you know? I, I like that he does his own homework and he's not suckered into groupthink and he'll put out what he thinks. And then immediately, with us two trashing Brian Thomas Jr. as a guy we're going to be way lower on than everybody else, Chris Sims is like, he's better than Marvin Harrison. I'm like, come on, Chris. Look, I can defend a certain level of out there outlier take, but that's going too far. It really is. Anyway, tomorrow we're doing our wide receiver show. Tomorrow. Full rankings. I have been watching Holy Cross wide receivers. I am deep into the draft class. It's going to be great. I'm excited about that show. And then today we're going to talk, we're going to react to a couple of other mock drafts that we put out there. Daniel Jeremiah and Mel Kuyper each throughout a mock draft since we did ours. So tomorrow we'll talk about the fact that Marvin Harrison Jr., today, Ohio State's Pro Day, has decided not to run. Good for him. Yeah. Good for Marvin. So people are upset. I need to run. Who else? Somebody else did that recently, right? They just went, I don't need to run. Not doing it. It's on the tape. How many recent receivers just didn't run? i look this up. Somebody fairly significant did that recently, I think. Not during the COVID year. The COVID year was awesome because you know, like Jamar Chase just like opted out and trained for the combine for seven months yeah. and then ran really fast. Right. But um, I don't. Chase, by the way, is another one of these guys where we got 
we're, we're in the period now of overrating, overthinking Marvin Harrison Jr. We had, yeah. we had Chris Sims out there doing it. A bunch of other people are saying, ah, is he really that good? Uh, this we happened. didn't see Jalen Waddle or Devontae Smith run. Yeah, they, well, one of them was injured, right? But yeah, yeah. Um, might have been Smith. Uh, Drake London didn't run. Drake London was the one who was probably going to run four five fives. Right. Just four, said no. it's better not to. Put he said take. no. <laughs> uh, Jameson Williams was hurt. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, what the hell was I saying? Interrupted you. I know. Overthinking. Right. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were we're in the period now of overthinking Marvin Harrison Jr. This happened to Jamar Chase as well, right? We just got bored with Jamar Chase and started nitpicking the fact that he was good at everything. When yeah, but is he really special at anything? You know, we, there was a, a serious period of time where everyone was asking that question about Jamar Chase. Is ah, is he actually that good? Because he's just boringly good at everything. You know, and then it turned out we were overthinking that. Yeah. And now that's where we are with Marvin Harrison right now. Um, so one other thing I want to throw out there. We did this last year, and that is draft bets. So just like we've done before the season. And by the way, everybody should now have their free PFF Plus subscription that would have bet off you hook us. everybody up? I finally did that. Um, you should have had an email from PFF that gave your password, et cetera. So if you didn't, number one, check. Uh, and if you didn't get that and you are 100% certain you want to bet, remember there's a spreadsheet tracking these things, so there's some evidence. Uh, give me a shout, uh, NFL Podcast at pff.com, and we'll make sure you're done. All right, so I'm, I'm going to start with I'm going to start with a bet, and then we'll react to it. We got okay. Kuiper and, we got one and Daniel bet Jeremiah. I, I don't like I don't like what people are doing here. No, I don't like what some of our listeners are doing, and you should stop it immediately. This is addressed to Sam and Big Goofy. Big Goofy <laughs> with a trademark. <laughs> you don't like that. I don't. I don't. Because I enjoy that. I think that's quite funny. So. And, and the, the booth over there is laughing their ass off. People are laughing. So at behind, the moment. In the soundproof booth, we can hear a <laughs> mighty roar. Yeah. So at the moment, you're outvoted in terms of whether that's funny or not. <sighs> From Alex Lindsay. Love the pod as always. He wants to retract something about the Lions draft last year. Whatever. He has a new bet. Um, I don't remember this specifically, but he's saying, in the spirit of last year's Will Levis falling outside the top 20 being successful, so I'm assuming okay. he, he hit on that last week, Somebody he wants did. to bet that J.J. McCarthy will fall outside the top 20. If Ooh. that's not strong enough, I'll push it to falling out of the first round. I think that's, And he wants to toss some coffee on it. Oh, nice. So I think falling out of the top 20, given the hype right now, J.J. McCarthy has QB4 with six, seven, eight QB needy teams. I think that's a fair aggressive bet yeah um so that's that's what we're looking for here when we do the bets before the season we say tell us something either that we disagree with you know we said hey the Raiders are going to be terrible and you know I'm a Raiders fan they're going to win 12 games be aggressive and be bold yep and for the draft it doesn't have to be something that we disagree with but just be bold right what is what are your strongest draft takes what are your what are the bets that what do you want to place on the table mm -hmm. and uh, PFF plus subscription on the line if, if it hits NFL podcast at pff.com the chat is loving the big goofy thing by the way uh, David says big goofy is an incredible nickname you shouldn't have fumbled that one onto the podcast uh, somebody else said big goofy needs to be on t-shirts um, and then some other person <laughs> says uh, I'm wearing I'm wearing using my booster seat that that we got gifted. Uh, he knew that something fell off. Actually, it's if that you have, somebody if we create sitting, a booster seat shirt. Yeah, I'll wear a big goofy shirt. The issue is not that I am I'm using the booster seat, which is still over there in the chair under my crap. Um, it's that somebody adjusted your chair and you're lower than you normally are. I think. Am I lower? Yeah, I got to get back up here. Hold on. There we go. I don't think you need to be. I'm just saying that's the that's I don't the height like problem it. It felt, going on right now. Off. Now I just screwed up. Yeah, the shot. How's my solo shot? Right, Devin. We good? We good? All right. All right, let's talk. You want to talk ball? <laughs> we ready to talk ball? This is PFF goofy. <laughs> all right, while well, you're chuckling over there. It's, 20, it's 2020. Uh, now, I'm, now I'm talking ad reads while you guys are all laughing at me. It's 2024, bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life. Well, here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term life insurance policy. That's right. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. 
Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. That's meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash pffnfl. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company not available in certain states. Price subject to underwriting and health questions. Daniel Jeremiah dropped a mock draft. Yeah. As did Mel Kuyper. Mm -hmm. Daniel Jeremiah uh, tweeted out prior to the mock draft if he's going to, what did he say, choose chaos? Yeah, something like that. Um, he said he did. The chaos at the top of his mock draft, over at NFL.com, by the way. Uh, mock draft 3.0 for Daniel. Um, he's got Caleb Williams going number one mm -hmm. to the Bears. He's got Drake May still going number two to the Washington Commanders. Yep. Um, I'm on board with that. I know that the odds are in favor of Jaden Daniels right now. I still, I'm leaning Drake May, both my own preference and what I would predict. Jaden Daniels going number three to the yep. Patriots, kind of chalkish through three. Sure. And then the move. The Minnesota Vikings will trade up to number four. We played this game in our mock on Monday, but we, we did it at number three. Right. The Vikings trade up to number four to get J.J. McCarthy, the Michigan quarterback. So four QBs off the board in the top four. And then the other aggressive move is the New York Jets trading up for Marvin Harrison Jr. from 10 to 5 to go get the first non-QB off the board. Now this was presumably before they signed Mike Williams, correct? Before they signed Mike Williams. And you know me, Sam. I say <clears throat> get to four elite playmakers. Yeah. Is, you know, it feels... I don't think the Mike Williams signing precludes a move like this. But I will say the Jets, the Jets signing Mike Williams is a story, an important story. Yeah. And a, good, and a good job by the Jets, adding a Mike Williams, um, shoring up the offensive line as we talked about the other day, so they're not coming in with these massive needs. The sandwich came up Trump's. Do you see that? They got him a uh, ham, egg, and cheese. I well, they believe. didn't. Some, some like crazy Jets Twitter fan. Like, oh, it was from that. Delivered, like door dashed them, door dashed him in a breakfast sandwich. That's what it was. had to like pass security and stuff. And they were like tweeting at the Jets, hey, let me know when you get this. I will say. The Jets Twitter was like, it arrived, it's here. And then they gave it to him. The New York, New Jersey bagel situation is legit. The, ba and the bagel, like they have good bagels. Is unbelievable bagels. Okay. Yeah, there's it's something. You know, the water, whatever it is, it's the, the water. there's something in the water. The bagels in okay. New York, New Jersey are different. They're just they're different, right? I have family members who uh, my brother-in-law's a pilot, and when he flies through New York, he used to live in Brooklyn or whatever. When he flies through New York, he stops, you know, stocks up on bagels and brings them home. Because he lives in, oh, in Salt Lake or whatever now. And he brings them home and freezes them. You know, so, he, so he's got bagels for the future. They're, they're that good. And that's what kept Mike Williams in the building for the sandwich. Jets. Yeah. I mean, it worked. Um, I don't – yeah, it, it feels a little bit like the Chicago Bears move where um, I don't – you're right. Neither one of them, Mike Williams to the Jets or Keenan Allen to the Bears, it doesn't stop you drafting um, – Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., whichever wide receiver is there. Now, it's slightly different because Chicago, I think, is sitting there. Like, they're like, if one of them lands at nine, it doesn't stop us taking one, particularly yeah. because, you know, Allen's probably not a long-term solution, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it probably makes it very unlikely, I think, that the Jets would trade up, get aggressive, and start going after a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr., it, you know, it doesn't preclude it, doesn't mean it can't happen, but I think it certainly makes it less likely. I don't – yeah, it probably makes it less likely, I mean, that they would they would trade up. But they are in aggressive mode. Sure. In, in trading up for Marvin Harrison Jr. versus, say, waiting on a Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze to fall. Right. I don't think either of those moves is clear, like, oh, this – you know, having Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr. versus some of the other receivers means they're going to win this year. You know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But I think the Jets are in aggressive mode, right? They got, yeah. They, they traded for Morgan Moses. They signed Tyron Smith. They bring in Mike Williams. By the way, Mike Williams and Tyron Smith, I mean, they, they need to invest in a couple extra hot tubs, maybe. You know, keep those guys fresh. Keep them healthy. Um, but they're, you know, Aaron Rodgers coming off of injury. They are... Are they changing the turf this year? It's happening at some point. Is it happening? I don't know. It's for future World Cup game? Or? Well, Real Madrid and somebody are playing at MetLife this summer, I think. So they're going to have to change the turf for that. Or they can't possibly be putting it back only to change it later. Any turf experts here No. If, uh, I just need a turf okay. timeline. Turf timeline. Yeah. Anyone do the, the research here? They have to be changing it for the summer because the, like no big soccer team will play on that kind of crap. They insist that they change it. So yeah. 
it would seem madness to me that they would change it back after changing it to grass only to change it to grass again later on in the future yeah um anyway i, I you can make multiple receivers work and sure. And, and honestly, a Marvin Harrison, I, I would love this. I would love a nice aggressive move. I don't like trading up for players, especially when there's there's a thought that Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze are, you know, similar in, in the, yeah. skill. My only question with this would be they're sitting there at 10 as things stand, right? So if quarterbacks go 1, 2, 3, 4, there's three top-tier wide receivers on the board and only six remaining picks, or five remaining picks before they get to, before one of them right. gets to you. My question would be, are we good enough at identifying the best one of these three to make it worth trading up to four to make it happen, or five to make it happen, rather than just sitting there at 10, being fairly confident that one of the three will be available when we pick and doing what I was saying the Bears could do and just taking them as a good value option. I would say we're probably not. Like, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. should be wide receiver one in this draft class. I also think we have to recognize that as as a society, we're bad enough at identifying that that it's not worth gambling on. The famous, the one I remember, um, Bill's trading up for Sammy Watkins. Yeah. And then Mike Evans went three picks later. And then Odell Beckham Jr. went a few picks later. Sure. And and Sammy Watkins, I mean, if you watched college football for a few years there, I mean, Sammy Watkins was the dude over at Clemson. He was unbelievable. But that was one of those, hey, there's there's a lot of high-end potential receivers in this class. Yeah. Do you really want – and they went up from like 10 or 12. I mean, they went way up to go get him, and clearly Sammy Watkins was not better than Mike Evans and OBJ and maybe some others. Right. I mean, Sammy Watkins was – yes – Injuries makes that a fuzzier argument. I would point to the the 2020 draft instead and be like, the consensus in that draft was like the top three guys were Jerry Judy, CeeDee Lamb, Henry Ruggs, right? And it was in some order, one of those three. (coughs) Pick your favorite. It's a good example. Ruggs ended up being the number one guy, right? Right. And and then it was sort of CeeDee Lamb and, and, and Jerry Judy. And Justin Jefferson has been by far the best wide receiver in that draft class, right? And obviously, he he famously went after Jalen Rager as number four. One pick after. And Brian, um, Brian, Brandon Ayuk was wide receiver six. Right. T. Higgins was wide receiver seven. They're two of the most coveted receivers in the NFL right now. It's a trade uh, commodity. So the point being, if, you know, if you were going to aggressively trade up to go get the number one guy in that draft class, whether you thought it was Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy, CeeDee Lamb, you might have, have nailed it if you'd taken C.D. Lamb, but you still would be looking at it and saying, I mean, Justin Jefferson was better. We could have stayed where we were and gotten him. I'm just saying, if you're the Jets and you want to be that aggressive, let's go get one more weapon. I would sit where I am at 10 rather than go after the guy that you think is the best. Plato Plato from Play-Doh, the chat. Plato, it's a good Says, name. when are we getting the J.J. Watt guest mock? And uh, I would say, I mean, if, if the people want J.J. Watt on the podcast, why don't, you, why don't you tag him on Twitter? Tweet him, yeah. Yeah, go tell J.J. At He's... J.J. Watt, go talk to the PFF NFL podcast. Talk, talk, talk some greats. Break them all down. Yeah, I wonder if we could peer pressure J.J. Watt into coming on the show. Would... Not for a you know, confrontation, just to talk it out. I'm ready for confrontation. Bring, oh, you're ready for bring your buddy. I mean, I, I, I would be very cordial with J.J. <laughs> Um, I also realize I've, I've intimidated some other former NFL players before. I think Taylor though, Luan was intimidated by me. Yeah. Just saying. Well, so we, somebody. Joe Thomas was not. They were tweeting out the hand size thing, right? And apparently Taylor Luan's got very little hands for, for a large man. That would explain why. You, I on the other hand, him. have record setting hand size for an NFL athlete, right? So I think that's what we need to get the intimidation factor. You need to handshake the person. Um, two other things. Uh, Mike Hess. He wants to bring back Mike Renner. I would love to have Renner on the show at some point here. The late Michael. The late but still alive Mike Renner. Mike Hess also drops a Johnny Wilson wide receiver four. So tomorrow's wide receiver rankings. Can't wait to figure. I, I don't know who wide receiver four. But you've, you've tweeted it out. Four through 15. It's, just, yeah, it's chaos. Just a mess. Madness. Can't wait to hear what everyone in the chat's wide receiver four is. I can't tell tomorrow. you it's not Johnny Wilson for me. It's probably not Johnny Wilson. Yeah. Um, other interesting things in Daniel Jeremiah's mock, and one other. Yeah, so I'm, I'm with you. Like the trade up for a wide receiver, risky. We know this. You know, I've been saying this forever. Especially whatever you're going to give up, multiple players to go get Harrison. Right. But the Jets are in aggressive mode, so it's an interesting thought. Uh, Daniel has Malik Neighbors going to the Giants. I don't want to give the whole thing away. You got to go click on it. But the uh, Joe Waltz goes to the Titans. I love that fit. I've said that before. The Falcons take Dallas Turner at eight. And as I've said before, I think the Falcons at eight. There's an interesting spot for the Falcons, the Bears, 
um, those two teams that don't have to force – like the Bears have done the other work at receiver now that they don't have to force a receiver pick. The Falcons and Bears have an opportunity to take the best defensive players on the board. And I know this is an offensive heavy draft, and every mock draft has offensive players going for the first six, eight, ten picks. But that is an appealing best edge – best corner available at eight and nine for the Falcons and the Bears and we see that whatever whatever you think of Dallas Turner the Falcons have the top defensive player on the board there's a realistic chance they'll have their pick of their top defensive player at eight. sure um I think though the other giant headline coming out of this mock draft is that that little quarterback desperate alley that previously was Minnesota Denver uh Las Vegas almost said Oakland there um the Vikings go get their guy. They trade up to go get J.J. McCarthy. The Broncos pass on a quarterback in the first round. Do not select one, a number 12 overall. They went with Brock Bowers instead, which pretty fun, but who's your quarterback? And then the Raiders select Michael Penix Jr. as their quarterback at number 13 overall. All of this like, hey, his, his stock would be a round higher if we just take out the national title game. Apparently they did. The yeah. Raiders just went, eh, pretend that game didn't happen. And then Michael Penix Jr., number 13 overall, exactly where people were saying he was going to go right before that game happened. Doing mock drafts for all 32 teams are difficult because you're sitting there and you know Daniel's looking at this saying, okay, the Broncos need a quarterback. As we mentioned, we talked through this the other day, they don't have a second-round pick. Mm-hmm. So what the heck are they going to do? Like, What are they going to do? And the first four QBs are off the board. They could be in this position. Hell. So Daniel just goes with, hey, we'll take Brock Bowers. He, I mean, it felt like for the Broncos, he did not want to predict them, say, quote unquote, forcing a QB, but he was okay with the Raiders. And I, again, I have no idea how much when an insider, like a Daniel Jeremiah, Mel Kuyper, they're half insider, half evaluators, right? Sure. Um, maybe Mel's more insider now than evaluator, whatever it is. I mean, I wonder how much of that is just, I, I know Sean Payton won't value a Michael Penix. Or, you know, they'll make a move for a Bo Nix later, you know, what, what, what the thinking is. But it's interesting to see Penix's name in the top 13. And I feel like the buzz has soured a little bit on Penix. We're only talking about the top four. But Penix going in the top, uh, top 15, I think, is absolutely possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was, it's what we were saying. Like, if you, if you simply remove that game, the one game from his resume, we are talking about a guy that was seen as a mid-first rounder who is, whose stock was going up. And then that one game happened. It's like, ah, he's a second-round guy, Max. Yeah. Like, he's a second-round option for teams. Teams don't, don't want to take a guy in the first round. You can come back in the second, get Michael Penix Jr. I mean, it, it's, it's the opposite of that C.J. Stroud conversation. How much should you weigh one game versus everything else? Because that's what's happening to his stock right now. Um, the, other, the other question with Penix is going to be, well, the, the early injuries. And, and, and they, they are – compare that to Laiatu Latu, who, by the way, goes 19 to the Rams here. And we had a question, I think, in the comments about his his medical, right? I think Latu and Penix, the medical always comes up in conversation. But I think it's gonna. I, again, I don't know how much how true this is necessarily. I don't haven't I haven't talked to all thirty two teams. So I get, think it's gonna land in the positive for those guys. Well, just for people who don't know, what is Latu's medical situation? He was. Um, uh, Trevor has the full story, right? He asked him at the Senior Bowl, but right? He was medically retired at Washington, right? And it was, I think it was like a little extreme. It com- it comes across as it was a little extreme. It was kind of forced a little bit. He had a it was a neck injury, right? Yeah. He had a neck injury, and the team essentially the team's medical staff effectively determined that 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 it was best for him not to play on through it, um, and they retired him. And then he went so elsewhere, and other people have had like recovered, rehabbed, etc. Yeah, second opinion. Yeah, and then other people essentially have determined now nah, you're good. Right. So, so it, that's what I'm saying. I feel like that is probably enough in the rearview mirror that he'll be okay. And then the Penix one, he had two ACLs at Indiana. Right. That was four or five years ago, and it's another one. He's played three full seasons since that point. And he's a little bit older, you know. Maybe the age thing comes in, but right. I think that's enough in the rearview mirror that people aren't concerned about. Hey, there'll be a you know, dude's going to tear an ACL every other year. Yeah, I mean, we've seen enough players have multiple ACL ACL tears and still been functional functional NFL players after that. It's not like two ACL tears equals chronic knee problems. Like Thomas Davis, didn't he tear one back to back like years? The same ACL, yeah. like pop pop, two consecutive seasons and then came back. It's not you know an ACL again. 
<laughs> I've never torn my ACL, so I would be, I'm not speaking from a position of experience, but they have become relatively routine injuries in today's NFL. It's not like assuming there's no, you know, additional ancillary damage when you do the ACL, it's not like you're going to have permanent knee problems just because you tore an ACL, even if you tear uh, an ACL more than once, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the man's knees are, you know, balsa wood. The other interesting, some other interesting picks to me, um, the 25 to 30 range, a bunch of players who I think are getting more top 15 type of hype. Amarius Mims, the tackle out of Georgia, he went 25 to the Packers. Uh, 27 and 28, two of the defensive tackles. Byron Murphy, the second, goes to Arizona. I think that was one of our fits, wasn't it? Didn't we do that? Byron Murphy to Arizona in ours? And uh, Drazon Newton, Drazon Johnny Newton, going to the Bills at 28. He prefers Johnny, right? That's we've, we've had this declaration. Is that where we are? I believe so. We're at Johnny now? Um, but those two defensive tackles, I think you and I struggled. We, we looked at them, considered them all the way through the teens, and they ended up landing in the late 20s in our mock draft on Monday, and uh, Daniel Jeremiah has something similar with those yep. two defensive tackles. Um, wide receivers as well. So this is supposed to be I'm, – I'm very torn on what the dynamic <clears throat> with the wide receiver position is going to be because on the one hand – like I tweeted this out yesterday. Like the other half of that – Ranking four through 15 is chaos. You could just like throw down any order you like because they're all insane and really good. The flip side, or the, the other half of that tweet is if you want a wide receiver in the second or third round, it's Christmas for you right now. Like there's so many of those guys. So I'm torn on what the effect of that is going to be, certainly in the first round. On the one hand, you look at this and say, there are 15 or 20 wide receivers coming out of this class that are going to be good NFL players I don't need to take a guy in the first round. I can wait. I can get him in the second. I can get him in the third. Um, on the other hand, there are going to be seven or eight guys that have a first round grade in abstract terms. So how many of them are actually going to go in the first round? Do you just take the guy because he's good and he's value? Or do you say, no, there's, this is such a good class. I'm going to wait and get a receiver later. <clears throat> let's look at the last couple of years just as a – let's go through this. The last couple of years as an example. So last year – Jackson Smith and Jigba was the first receiver off the board at 20, and then there was a run. Right. Quentin Johnston at 22, Say Flowers at 23, Jordan Addison at 24. All Remember last year, there was no consensus number one. It was, it was mostly between Smith and Jigba and Jordan Addison. Some people, though, loved Say Flowers. Some people really believed in Quentin Johnston. Mm -hmm. But it was seen as a weaker group of first-round receivers, right? 2022 was that monster year. Where, you know, again, we say this every year, everybody's going to have a different number one wide receiver. And Drake London was the first receiver off the board at eight. And then the run was much earlier, right? Garrett Wilson at 10, Chris Olave at 11, Jameson Williams at 12, Jahan Dotson at 16, and then Traylon Burks at 18. That felt like those guys were all expected to go in the first round and went to go in the first round. Um, the 2021 class, you mentioned the. Jamar Chase year, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, Devontae <coughs> Smith, 5, 6, 10. Yeah. There's a little bit of drop off, Kadarius Tony, and then Rashad Bateman at 20 and 27. So we're talking five, six, and four receivers in the first round in the last couple of years. The dynamic in this class is I think they'll be the top three who all could go in the top 10. Um, it does seem like the consensus is much closer to Brian Thomas being the clear yeah. wide receiver four. So maybe there's a top four as far as the consensus goes. But how many of 5 through 15 do feel much more interchangeable than in previous years? Well, this year, to me, it's like you get those first three guys that are probably gone in the top 10 picks. If we assume the consensus is going to have Brian Thomas Jr. taken in the first round as well, even though we're going to be different and we're going to talk it out tomorrow why we're different, um, then you're going to, so you're at four very likely first rounders. And then I think you have like easily half a dozen guys that wouldn't surprise me to be taken in the first round. Like, it would not at all shock me if any of the following players, uh, Adonai Mitchell, Keon Coleman, Troy Franklin, Lad McConkey, um, Xavier Worthy. Xavier Worthy, Xavier Leggett. Like, there's six, seven, eight. I, a lot of these guys, it would not shock me if they were taken in the first round. Now, obviously, it would shock me if all of them were taken in the first round or, or a lot of them. But so DJ's mock, he's got Adonai Mitchell going 32 to Kansas City. So five wide receivers is his total. Brian Thomas Jr. is wide receiver four, and then Adonai Mitchell, the Texas wide receiver, as wide receiver five, and that's it. Yeah. So that's how many? Six? Five. Five, okay. Yeah, so it's in, I think it's a deep wide receiver class, but at the end of the day, I don't know. We're basically saying we don't know how many end up going right. in the first round. 
Uh, anything else on uh, on DJ's mock here? Uh, he has Quinion Mitchell, I think, right, as, as cornerback one off the board. I think that's reasonably interesting. The Chargers, having traded down, do not get their wide receiver because Roman Dunze goes one pick before to the Bears. Um, they end up picking Talese Fuaga at, uh, at right tackle. So having traded away all, or cut, got, ridden, got rid of all of their offensive skill position players, they don't get him in the first round, but we just talked about second and third round as wide receiver Christmas, so they're not out of the running. All right, let's get to, uh, to Mel Kuypers. His is uh, paywalled over at ESPN.com. Are we giving away too much? We'll talk about Mel. Yeah. Um, yes, the godfather man. of NFL draft coverage. I'll tell you what, it was fun watching, like, the 97 draft. And um, do you want can – I, can I ask you on air? Can I put you on the spot? We'll, can you do one watch along with us this draft season? Is it better before or after the draft? Like, I'm, I'm itching to do this. Can't I, do it before. We can't do it after the draft. We'll do it before? Yeah. Yeah, it can't be after. Hey, the draft's just Let finished. us know. If we draft. were to do – so there's a couple options for the watch along. I would put it into three potential buckets. Okay. We're either going to do something super retro, which for us is like the 90s, you know, 95, 96, 97, old school draft. It's gonna, or it's going to be something early PFF era, but we didn't have college data. So to me, the 2011 draft was fascinating. That would be an interesting one for the reason that... All the QBs, the Hall of Famers. But in particular, that this quarterback class is starting to look a little bit like that one in terms of we've got Cam Newton, number one, and then we started to push up all the other quarterbacks because teams needed quarterbacks. Like That's the dynamic that's at play right now. The Patriots, the Vikings, the Broncos, the the, uh, Raiders, all these teams need quarterbacks. So we're talking Michael Penix Jr., 13 overall. I mean, this is screaming Christian Ponder, Jake Locker, right, where... People didn't want to take those guys in the, in the middle of the first round, but they had to. So you've got 2010, 11, 12, those types of drafts. 11 is very intriguing. So we didn't have, so we didn't have college takes at the time, right? We didn't have college data. The, uh, the third one would be, do we want to go back and watch something we've never watched before because we've always been live on the air, say 2018 or 2019. So something more recent, we would be watching an NFL network or an ESPN broadcast for the first time ever and reacting – and being able to say, here's what we thought at the time. We were live on the air, and here was my reaction to this pick. And we, we know what, what happened when Saquon Barkley went number two and what we had suggested and what's, what's happened, right? So those would be my three suggestions. We do something super retro, early 2010s or whatever, and then something over the last five, six, seven years where we actually had takes and information and big boards and the whole thing and compare it to what's happened recently. But I would, I would love to do that. I think that'd be fun. Um, all right, let's go to Mel. He's got Jaden Daniels. So Caleb Williams, number one. He's got Jaden Daniels going number two. Mm-hmm. He also, Mel, has Jaden Daniels as his number two receiver, not by a wide margin over Drake May. He says he's got them all in, their, in his top six, and then a distant fourth would be J.J. McCarthy. Right. So like D.J., it's quarterback one, two, three. The only difference is he flipped the order of Jaden Daniels, Drake May. Correct. Which is basically, I mean, at this point, that is becoming in some – what those two put together is the consensus right now. We're getting Caleb Williams number one. We're getting one of the other quarterbacks number two and the other one at number three. That's everybody's mock draft currently. And then the next group of players is very similar to DJ's. It's Marvin Harrison Jr., but to the Arizona Cardinals. Of right. course, a pick earlier because there's no trade up. Malik Neighbors to the Chargers. Roma Dunze to the Giants. So the top three receivers, boom, right off the board. We go three QBs, three receivers, and then Joe Waltz to Tennessee. The fit again. And then Dallas Turner to Atlanta again, which, you know, it seems like um, a lot of the insiders are leaning that way. Atlanta at eight, taking Dallas Turner, first defensive player off yeah, the board. Yeah, it's interesting that everyone's given the Giants a receiver. Um, you know, not a quarterback, number one. So they're not taking J.J. McCarthy in these, in these situations. Um, the, like, the consensus appears to be building for the Giants that they are committing to Daniel Jones for at least one more season. Now, is that because they think we only have we don't have the runway to get rid of Daniel Jones going in, the, in another direction? We're tied to him for a year, and his fortunes will determine our fortunes, or simply because they don't like JJ McCarthy as QB four. Uh, either way, it's not a quarterback at this point. It's and they seem to be looking to give him wide receiver help rather than offensive line help. I, I don't know if they're assuming that the job they've done in free agency is an, is enough for that offensive line. Like we brought in a John Runyon we brought in a Jermaine Illuminor and we're like we're good 
I mean, yeah. you might be, but that's that's a little scary. Some of the feedback we got on the Giants mock drafts taking Joe Alt the other day was like, oh, we can't take a right tackle. I just want to continue to reiterate the value of the right tackle. doesn't matter. It's of equal value to the left tackle. Well, there are also – there were a lot of people, more than one person sort of complaining that we, we were acting – during that mock draft, like you can just take a player that played one side of the line, flip them to the other side of the line, there's no problem. I think the consensus has become now that you can take either side of the line. You can take a right ta- a college right tackle or a college left tackle and move him to the opposite side of the line immediately in his NFL career, and it's okay, right? There, there might be a transition time. There might like He's developing anyway. He's learning a whole new... Uh, way of playing just to adjust to the NFL level, you might as well throw one more thing on the plate and then get him used to the other side of the line. The only time it's a problem is when you're taking a guy that has played in the NFL for an extended number of years only on one side of the line and asking that guy to change to the other side and reverse everything he's ever known. At that, that's when it becomes a problem. The idea of taking a guy very early and saying you're going to play the other side of the line is kind of like it's fine. Maybe it won't work. Like there are some good Josh Jones. Josh Jones doesn't appear to be able to play anything other than left tackle for there some reason. There are specific reason. instances where it appears. Yeah, right? there are certain players because it's evidently it's different, right? There are going to be players that are inherently one-sided or other, right? I have no kind of left hand for anything. Like I'm extremely right-handed. Um, so there are going to be players like that that for whatever reason cannot play on the other side of the line. But I think at this point they're pretty rare. And the general consensus appears to be you can build it into your plan that we can take a tackle and move him to the other side of the line, and we're good. And if you end up finding one of those guys that can't play on that side, fine. But you shouldn't assume it's a problem before it manifests as one. Um, yeah, i got to go back really quick. I, I, look, I've spent a lot of years on this whole thing. The best – where did Caleb McGarry? He played. A lot of the best right tackles all played left tackle in college. I mean, that's it. Sure. It's just pretty simple. Uh, Panay Sewell. Mitchell Schwartz was a left tackle, moved to right. I mean, I did this, wrote about this over 10 years ago now. The move occurs all the time. So if you just want to use data to say, is this possible? Not is it difficult? Like, is it a challenge? Does it take more practice time? Is there transition time? Like, that's not the question. Is this possible? Does this thing happen often? A left tackle in college becomes a right tackle in the NFL. Yes, it happens often, very often. And a lot of the best right tackles in the NFL were all left tackles. Um, speaking of that, Trent Brown has signed with the Bengals. Yeah. A mighty roar from back there. We got Trent Brown and Orlando Brown, and you made a pitch that um, you want to see Trent Brown, 6'8", like, 370. Yes. Orlando Brown, 6'8", 350. And Steve Palazzolo, 6'10", 290-something. <laughs> Go to a buffet together. I yeah, I think that as content creators in the in the Cincinnati area, um, <laughs> we should take the Browns, the new Bengals Browns, and Steve Palazzolo to the local Fogo de Chao, the Brazilian state all you can eat steakhouse, and just watch you bankrupt that place with one dominant meat feast. I think that would be phenomenal content. I'm in. Particularly if if I come along as well as a conversation facilitator and or you know the way like <laughs> you'll be you, eating a salad yeah just well no balance just, things out. i'll just eat a normal volume of food yeah. right so it's like you know the way you see those images of like hey look at this prehistoric turtle and here's carlos for uh, for scale right i'm i'm carlos in this situation <laughs> for scale like here's a normal volume of meat that a human can eat at the fogo and then here's three monsters that are just destroying the place i feel like the Bengals should be all on board with that. That's, that's outstanding content. Yeah, you've seen me in action there <laughs> years ago when it's we went ridiculous. up to Sports Illustrated for the draft. I love how it gets to this point where it's like, I don't want all the meats anymore. I just want specific. I want filet or lamb chops. Yes. Or else that's it. I'm turning them down. We, we went out, a, a four of us, we went out to a steakhouse in Vegas when we were at the Super Bowl. And it was a high-end steakhouse. And, you know, they do these things. Where like, so the, the guy comes over. He's like... The, the steak for four has got your, your name written all over it, guys. And I'm like, you, he's one of the four. Four is not enough. You, and this was you sitting down. You haven't even seen right. you stood up, right? I'm like, we are going to need more than steak for four when you are one of the four. So he goes, okay, well, we'll get the steak for four and the steak for two. And then that steak for six. 
And that's probably good. And it, it turned out to be the right amount of meat. It was the right amount. Yeah. It was. We were not on the bone and the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Um, I actually, sorry, really quick. I brought up Trent Brown because yes. in his NFL career, you want to know what he's done? Here's where he's played. Right ta- by, by season, right tackle, right tackle, right tackle, left tackle, right tackle, right tackle, right tackle, left tackle, left tackle. And this year going back to right tackle with the Bengals. Trent Brown flips every two to three years. And his grades actually stay pretty consistent. He's one of the rare players, I think, in the NFL level. But he's, he didn't have like eight years of one side and then switch. He's been doing it every couple of years, and he's done it pretty successfully as a full-time player. Right. Anyway, we just went down rabbit holes. Mm. Uh, where's, D, where's, uh, where's, where's the rest of uh, Kuiper's mock here? Anything else interesting here? Now, the Bears at nine, I heard um, Kyle Brandt of Good Morning Football. Chicago guy, yep. and uh, you know he, get, he has good little rants. He has good little rants and analogies and the whole thing. And he went on a little, a little deal today where he was just like the Bears have basically got to do well by Caleb Williams. Got to do everything they can. Should be a receiver. Should be a tackle. Just all offensive players. And I think the Bears again are in an interesting spot because they've done a lot of good work at the you know at adding playmakers, DeAndre Swift and Keenan Allen, and they, they've got playmakers now, right? Gerald Everett. That I don't, and if the receivers do go ahead of them, the Bears are in an inter- interesting spot where I, don't, I still don't trust their defense. I think their defense was solid down the stretch, added Montez Sweat. But they go Jared Verse here at number nine. Yeah, I don't think they have to force an offensive player just because of Caleb Williams. They could get the best or second best defensive player off the board at nine. Yeah, they could, absolutely. Um, they um, Kuiper is one of these people that was – he allowed, he's allowed the Keenan Allen move to change his thing. He said before Keenan Allen move, he would have said the Raiders, or the Bears rather, should go and get a top wide receiver, right? And with Keenan Allen there, they don't need to. They can go in a different direction, whether that's tackle or whether that's defense. And he gave the Bears Jared Verse. So then you have the, uh, the Jets and Brock Bowers. We did this the other day. This is going to be the most common mock draft fit, I think, going forward. The Jets at 10 and Brock Bowers. And I, and I think it's viable because of what they've done. with adding. Mike, but we did this before they added Mike Williams the other day, right? right. And we said Brock Bowers is your, your next pass catcher. This is going to be the most common fit, I think. And, you know, where does Bowers go? He's always been a top 10 caliber player, the size thing. I think, he'll, I think we're going to see more of this. And then the Vikings at 11, they stay there and pick J.J. McCarthy. Now, Mel doesn't do all the trades usually in his right. box. So J.J. at 11, is that – possible for the Vikings to just sit there and get QB4. I feel like the fact that they've added that first round pick already from Houston, you know, they're they're amassing ammunition suggests they're not going to risk it, you know. They're going to make a move yeah. and not chance the fact that QB4 will be available when they pick. Like I just don't think the Vikings are picking 11 by the time the draft rolls around, they're going to move because they've already shown their hand in that regard um and then the other thing coming off the back of that is he has denver this time taking the quarterback and going bo nix bo which nix. is what we did so he has bo nix as qb5 not michael Penix. right and he has the broncos taking bo nix i thought we you know felt like a reach from us taking bo nix there um but this is what we're this is what we're dealing with the the desperate teams are sitting there at 11 12 13 we might see desperate measures when it comes to the quarterback position yep um anything else that stood out here uh, so, also, wide receiver four for him is Brian Thomas Jr. This is, as you said, the growing consensus. Um, he hasn't gone to Pittsburgh. So, the Russell Wilson, Justin Fields combination of quarterback has got a, a speedster now to work with. I got, I got something for you here. Oh, yeah? You ready? Sure. The DJ, ready for DJ and Mel yeah. comparison here. At pick, starting at pick 14, they both have the Saints taking Olu Fashnu. Steal for them. They both have the Colts taking Quinion Mitchell, the cornerback out of Toledo. Mm. They both have the Seattle Seahawks taking Troy Fontenot at 16. Just double checking, making sure that's true. <laughs> and they both have the Jags taking Terry and Arnold, the cornerback out of Alabama at 17. So four straight picks nice. where they are in lockstep here on March 18th, 19th, whenever these came out. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> both of them, I think, have Graham Barton, the the guard, essentially, from Duke going quite high in the first round. I th- I've seen that happening see, more and more as well. DJ's putting Barton at 21 to the Dolphins. So has Mel. Wow. A lot of similarities there. They didn't get the Latu to the they both Rams. Have, are they just copying off each other? They both had Nate Wiggins to the Eagles, right? Didn't I see that in DJ's? They do. Yes, they both have Wiggins to the Eagles. This is amazing, actually, <laughs> that we're discovering this on the fly. 
Um, I, I've said this before, Sam. Is there a, have there we just uncovered a, a plagiarism uh, scandal in, in the draft community? I think we have. Sweet. I think we have. They're in, maybe they're just on the second, same text chain. Maybe. Hey, uh, I, got, I got word Wiggins to the Eagles. What if they both use the same ghostwriter? Oh, that would be great. Imagine, <laughs> imagine the same ghostwriter secretly working for both NFL.com and ESPN. We can't, put a, we can't put that out there. We'll get into trouble. We're going to get sued get again. Our lawyers are on double time here. Um, part of, I think, the allure of the PFF NFL podcast, right? There are some podcasters out there, people, who are, you know, very good at preparing. They got all their notes. Hmm. You know they put hours of time into preparing. Nice. And I'm not saying we do a lot of work, right? You've just you've been grinding film for 900 receivers. Holy Cross, right? Holy Cross receiver. Don't hate on Holy Cross. Southern, Worcester. southeastern Missouri State. Worcester, Somebody. Mass. I, I just random guys that I've been told to watch and watch. My uh, my link to Holy Cross, of course, is my uh, little league teammate is their tight ends and special teams coach, or at least was until he moved on. Of course, to James Madison. So naturally connected there. Um, but what I was going to say. Part of the allure of our podcast is us. We've got a certain level of prep preparation, but sitting here on the fly figuring things out. Mm -hmm. On the fly, going back and forth between two tabs here, trying to figure out uh, how many of the same picks do they have here. Um, That's fun. Another one you flagged yesterday when this came up yes. is Mel matched us and put Xavier Worthy to Tampa Bay. Now, clearly, he was watching on Monday and Obviously. said, yeah, I love what Sam's idea was. <laughs> it's just plagiarism left, right, and More plagiarism. <laughs> Mel's just copying everybody. I think it's Mel's fault. <laughs> clearly. He's the one copying. Oh, DJ's got some good picks. Let's just go with these. So we've uncovered. Sam and Steve have Worthy going to the Bucks. We've uncovered the scandal, and now we've identified who's, who's at fault. Uh, now Mel's going to sue us along with the Buffers <laughs> and Ray Lewis. I mean, I'm just. It's a lot of legal problems you're getting yeah. us into. Litigation left and right over here. Yeah. Whatever. What else we got going on here? Chop Green Robinson goes late first in both mock drafts. DJ yeah. And Mel. Green Bay getting Lie to Latu. The UCLA edge rusher at 20, 25? Man, that would be a steal for them, I feel. Are, are there are there hedges here with Latu? Is there just like in the – if there was zero medical history there, is he going top 10? I don't know. I No, I don't think he would. I feel like – I think you're right that the majority of teams are clearing him medically. And they – you know, because that's like a neck injury that you've – that you've been retired from forcibly previously. Like, you're either on the board or you're not at that point, right? It's not, it's not this is dinging him around in our list. It's like, we either think this guy is viable or he's not. So I'm sure of 32 NFL teams, there's a handful that don't have Latu on their board for that medical thing, right? If, if Washington's um, medical staff was that concerned about it that they forcibly retired him, essentially, I'm sure there's a team or two in the NFL somewhere that is in agreement and just doesn't want the risk, and he's off the board. For everybody else, I think he's on the board, and he's where he would rank normally. I feel like Latu is is one of these guys that feels a little bit like a, a – I don't want to say this too harshly, but a poor man's Joey Bosa – where the narrative is the same, which is, is he maxed out? Is he already as good as he's going to get? Where's the room for growth? Like, can he get any better than this? Which teams tend to focus on as a problem – without sort of understanding where the baseline of that actually is. Like, yeah, he might not get any better than he is right now. On the other hand, he had a PFF pass rushing grade of like 95 last year. So how much better do you need him to be for him to be an elite NFL edge rusher? And that was the story with Joey Bosa. People were like, ah, can he get any better than this? Well, maybe not, but he walked into the NFL as a pro bowler. So who cares? Yeah, I think, I think someone's getting a steal. I mean, if he ends up mid, I, I, would, I would take him as high as 10. Same. Two. I would take him and as the he, first edge rusher off the board, yeah. and if he's there at 25, like at that point, he's one of the best value picks you could make. Someone's getting a steal. Um, so here's, here's the value in mock drafts, Sam. It's, it's fun. A, it's fun, right? We're it's just fun. having fun. We're talking scenarios, what could a team do? They're thinking about this, what about that? Those are fun. B, you see names. You just see different names. And Mel has a whole bunch of different names at the bottom of his first round. So this is the first time. I haven't, well, I, don't, I haven't looked at a bunch of mock drafts, but you don't often see T.J. Tampa from Iowa State in the first round. Correct. He's going to the Buffalo Bills. Yep. Uh, I could see the NFL really liking him. Big corner, moves pretty well. He's huge. Big dude. And I was at the game. I'm going to cite it every single time. I was yeah. at the game when he had an interception. 
So I'm I'm high on TJ Tampa. I was there an interception. in person, Got had it. an interception, and at least one other good play. Okay. Yeah. So I was there. Harry and I saw it. Harry loves him. So we were there. We saw it. So yeah, Mel Mel kind of goes off the reservation a little bit at the end of this mock. He gets, as he said, TJ Tampa to Buffalo, twenty eight, uh, cornerback, and then he has Roger Rosengarten, the offensive tackle from Washington. The other offensive tackle from Washington. I wanted to highlight, so Xavier Leggett, too, going in the first round to the Lions. As yes. we, we talked about all the different receivers. If any of them sneak into the first, not surprised. And obviously continues the plagiarism with Adonai Mitchell at uh, 32 to the Kansas City yeah, Chiefs. These similar picks between Mel and DJ. We need a full investigation from Congress. It's probably not plagiarism. Just with Probably that not. No, we're not. We're not accusing anyone. We're just saying... This- we should look into it. This is a very, uh, because of, you know. Let's for, stop all mock drafts until we understand <laughs> what's going on. Because, because of the First Amendment and all that kind of stuff, right? It's actually quite hard to get in trouble for, uh, for uh, liable and slander in this country. No, right? you don't get liable. You just get whacked these days. True. So that's what it is. But I, I, there are other jurisdictions in the world where the liable and slander laws are an awful lot more restrictive than they are here so i listen to an irish podcast and for some reason the irish libel laws are like ludicrously harsh right so anytime anybody jokes about anything the host has to be like just to be clear this is not (laughs) (laughs) so they don't get sued every three minutes that's great um so the rosengarden is currently so roger rosengarden he's Mm. the he was at the senior bowl he's a pretty good player sure but he's currently 115th on the consensus board right um, one of my favorite parts of the 1997 draft that I watched is when the Cardinals at number nine took a player that Mel said, I have 112th on my draft board. So now we're going full circle here. And who was it? Uh, the guy that I never heard of from the Cardinals. Oh, okay. He did not have a big career. It would be great if he did that and it was like, you know, some elite player. Uh, let me see. doesn't matter. It was just uh, in case it happened to be somebody really talented. No, it was. made him look silly. I will say, again, watching the old drafts, the few times when Mel's like, this is a massive reach. Usually, at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, it was pretty pretty right. Pretty nailed it. You were right. Again, I feel like, I think this is the story for a lot of things in the NFL, that everybody's just gotten better at that. I, I agree, yeah. Like like free agency, right? The, people are not giving out the absolutely insane contracts that used to be thrown around anymore, yeah. right? They're better at it. I think the Teams just... are not in sal- legitimate salary cap hell anymore. They're not doing the let's draft the random fifth round guy in the first round in the draft anymore. Like they're just better at all this stuff. The other interesting thing, you know, there was um, there was a story a couple weeks ago. I always I love my guy Tony Brackens back with the Jaguars. He was drafted in '96, and there was a story that came out that Robert Kraft, the Patriots, Bill Parcells wanted to draft him at seven, and he ended up going in like the second round. I feel like back then. Every team was far more siloed. There was less information out yeah. there. And they would have <clears throat> just a huge difference of opinion, right. right? And they would just go get their guy. And it's like, oh, the rest of the league thought he was third. Well, I got him in the first. And now there's so much more information. And I would say my board here is kind of sor- it's sorted by what the consensus thinks. And then you look within that range and you pick your favorite players within that range. So you want to do as best you can, I think, to pick players when they're supposed to go because you don't want to reach, not because you're going to miss. You don't want to reach because you probably can get them later. It's understanding who you can get and where. That's a huge data point that I think teams focus on right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Amarius Mims going at 30 to the Baltimore Ravens, the Georgia offensive tackle that's your size but jacked. Um, that's Feels pretty like that good would be steal. a good pick. And then the one I wanted to talk about as well, pick number 29, Xavier Leggett, the South Carolina wide receiver, going to the Detroit Lions. Um, without sort of previewing too much tomorrow's show, so Leggett was the guy that was listed at six foot three, 227 pounds. Uh, and then he showed up at the Senior Bowl, and when he was finally measured, turns out he's only 6'1", not 6'3", right? So that... That sort of fairly dramatically changes what you consider his body type to be. Like 6'3", 227 is just a giant. 6'1", 227 is kind of running back shaped. You know what I mean? It's a different body shape than you think he had from tape. Uh, but he's also a go-up-and-get-it guy. And a fast guy. Like he ran a 4'4", 4, 4'39", 4, 4, I think was his official 40 at the, com- at the combine. So Xavier Leggett is a guy who, when I did my – a lot of what I – so. I did all my tape watching, you know, notes on the wide receivers, yada, yada, yada. Stacked them roughly in my order. 
And then what I did yesterday was kind of go through guys again that I wanted to watch a second time that either I knew the consensus was different from me on, guys like Brian Thomas Jr., um, guys like uh, Keon Coleman, a couple other guys that I knew that I was off relative to other people on and wanted to get a second viewing of, made sure I was happy with my sort of take on them, and then kind of go through the notes that I'd written and use that to kind of remind myself what I thought of the player and actually move them around a little bit in the rankings and see if I'd been too harsh relative to what my notes were saying, right? Right. And Xavier Leggett was the guy where on the first ranking, I had him really, I had him quite low. And yesterday, I just kept sort of moving him higher and higher and higher relative to the other people. I'm like, ultimately, for all the, for the negatives that I have in the notes, the positives are things that should play. So why am I dropping him this low? Like the dude is 6'1", 227. He's built like A.J. Brown. He's fast as hell. And his, one of his best traits is that catch point stuff. Like even if he's not a complete wide receiver, the stuff that he's good at should be pretty damn good and I feel like is, is actually worth a first-round pick. And if you put him on Detroit where they already have Amon Ross and Brown, love it. Yeah, we'll we'll get into more detail tomorrow. But I think the the question on Leggett right now, there's you know, fantasy people do a lot of good work because they they only have to focus on running backs and receivers and tight ends for the most part as far as projections go. And fantasy um, analysts have done a really good job over the years looking at data and and how to how to parse through the noise when it comes to receivers. And they talk a lot about breakout age and they talk, you know they just use things like yards per route run and other data points, and Leggett is a late breakout, you know, long story short. Four years of nothing, and then a very good 2023. Those uh, profiles don't tend to work well at the NFL level. And that's and then when you look at the idea that, okay, he was a fifth-year player, does, you know, when, when a fifth-year player looks like a man among boys, right. then it's like, okay, what – that's a concern because that doesn't always translate to the NFL. So those would be the concerns for Leggett, we'll, and we'll get it into, particularly, into it more tomorrow. Yeah, particularly when you then take two inches off his height, and you're like, I mean, but just don't do that. Like he's just six one. It doesn't matter, right? What he but was six one. At. But that's different to sit. Like if the dude was six three, two twenty seven, there aren't many corners in the NFL that are even vaguely but, in the same ballpark as that. There I are corners it. that are in the same ballpark this, when you're six one. This was like the argu- argument you made a few weeks ago, which was like, who cares what the consensus board says right now? If the NFL board is completely different, maybe the consensus board was never right, right? The expected draft position was never right. The fact that he was never 6'3", it doesn't matter that you thought he was 6'3", because South Carolina listed him as such. It doesn't matter that you thought that. He's just 6'1". Right. So but, use that information. Yes. It doesn't matter what they like, – they could have listed him at 6'6". Six, six. It doesn't but, matter. He's 6'1". Yeah, but that is different to being 6'3". But it doesn't matter. Like, it just if you had watched him after he, you know, uh, had his height taken at the Senior Bowl – that wouldn't even be a part of your story. Right, but my point being, there is a reason that they measure these things. Because if, you, if it turns out you are three inches taller and 20 pounds heavier than anybody else you're going to be trying to, that's going to be trying to cover you, that is harder to stop. So as soon as you start chipping away at that and change that picture, it does change what the guy's capable of doing at the next level. Otherwise, we wouldn't measure it. We would just say, who cares? Look at the tape. It's there. Yeah, I, I, I understand why they measure height. I, I get that. And I'm just saying, it doesn't matter that on South Carolina's website it once said 6'3", and they lied. It doesn't matter. I mean... He's 6'1". That's yes. the information you need. Right. But that... Carry on. I mean, that's, that's my point. Like, that's, that's what we're talking about is a 6'1 receiver. Anything else? DJ and Mel, if you want to see two mock drafts that are near identical, go check, <laughs> <laughs> go check them out. <laughs> it was like... Or maybe DJ's the one. This is the one. This maybe, is the show that gets a suit. Maybe DJ's plagiarized it, and he goes, let Finally. me throw the scent off with a massive trade up, yeah. and then I'll copy that. I'll mail in the rest. Because Mel's the godfather. I copy the godfather. This is the show that gets a suit. This is the, I love you, DJ. You said Ray Lewis killed a guy. You put a bunch of other stuff out there, but this is the one that's getting this lawyer attention. DJ, come join the show. Talk about your mock. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Uh, do you want to, There's a couple mailbag questions. They weren't. Um, they're probably not one-off worthy, though. Okay. But it was just a couple quick questions. What do you Sorry, got? Sorry, Tyler. What do you got? Nick from Tennessee, loves the show. Good. Good start. Um, the second part of his. I don't remember what the first part was. I just copied the second part. <laughs> Given the Eagles' use of the double cheek push, still using the right name. Yeah. 
Should NFC East teams place a higher priority on massive defensive tackles like Devondre Sweat? Well, we saw um, we saw the impact that uh, Vita Veo was able to have against the Detroit Lions. Sweat uh, can have a similar impact against double cheek push. I, I mean, the other question I think is how much of the double cheek push was contingent on Jason Kelsey. Ooh, like they have Kelsey a new, the key? They have a new dynamic now. Kelsey's retired. They're moving what Cam Jurgens over to center. We're going to have Kelsey wit without. Data points. Data points. Yeah. And the other point people were making during free agency is that the combination of um, Jalen Hurts and Saquon Barkley can squat like 1,300 pounds. Like, how much is that important? That's a, good question. That's a lot of push. It's a lot of push, a lot of squat. Even without there. Jason Kelsey. So we're going to get – it's an interest. it's a new world for the double-cheek yeah, push this year. We got Witt without Saquon, Witt without Jason Kelsey. But this is also, by the way, why they didn't ban it. Like – it's one play that one team was abnormally successful with. Most other teams are not able to do it, and the team that was good at it just lost one of the people that's being identified as, like, he's why it works. Yeah. So they might stink at it this year. To answer the question, I love the concept. <clears throat> I love the idea. I agree, Vita Vea. If you have a Vita Vea 350-pound type, that could help in that situation. I am not inclined, it is not in my nature, to draft a player who's – going to go second or third round like Sweat, who I like a lot as a player. I, it is not in my nature to draft a player because of three, four, five plays that are going to occur during the season. That does not make sense to me. Of the thousand plus defensive plays, you're not going to make a draft pick specifically for that. Unless he was a seventh rounder. Like if you had a seventh round 350 pounder I don't hate it as I mean that's not the only thing they're doing like a seventh round run stopper is fine but I'm not making that move just because I'm the Giants Cowboys or the Commanders and I'm like man I gotta stop Hurts and double cheek push if you're sitting there in the fourth round and Sweat's still there and he's a second round value and you fit him into your team fine because he has other value right besides just the one play sure um, and then Austin Putz asks, asks us a lot of data questions mm. like he's a, he's a data guy so he's asking us how do we deal more so for me, Sam. I don't know how much modeling you're doing. Not a lot. How do you guys deal with missing data from the combine in your models? I presume either you have a naive imputation or utilize mice or something like that. But Steve mentioned something about the pro day, which I don't understand, as I assume you don't run at the combine, you won't at the pro day, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'm not... Well, there are a lot of people that do run at pro days that don't run at the combine. They do both. Yeah, they, there are a lot that do. Um, what, I, I, what we've done in the past and what I tend to do is just I have... I do have a model that just kind of takes the average and just plops that in there. And so there's a, a, there's an adjustment that some people do because the reason you don't run at the combine and then do run at your pro day is because your pro day track is faster or you think it's faster. So there is a general consensus, I think, that pro day numbers are juiced a little bit relative to combine Before numbers. Before Eric left, he did that. So he, right. had, he had this file that he would share with me that was, oh, I don't know, 90% lower for the pro day right um whatever that might have been because historically it is faster um there's reasons of the it was 90 percent of the total yeah. right so if you run four five it might show up as like four five two or four yeah. five three well ten percent lower rather ten percent ninety percent not yeah, yeah sorry trust me I, trust me trust the model <laughs> this is oh this is upside down now this is all inverted uh, actually what you want you're is, right yeah. marvin harrison jr is terrible mm. Uh, give me Bub Means as wide receiver one. There's some sneaky. There's a lot of Bub. I watched Bub Means. You yesterday. watched Bub. Finally Bub. got around to Bub Means tape. You got down to Bub Means, number 236 on the draft board, 21% model. You know that man's He's average fast. depth of target is like 18 yards downfield? He's fast. He was a 4 3 6 guy. Yeah. And uh, Feldman Freak. He's, He's on the he Feldman Freak a, list. He's pretty good. Um, I'm interested to know if uh, who people would want us to interview during draft season here. Um, we might have an O line. Guest coming up soon. Uh, we've talked. We've talked to Bruce Feldman in the past. We'd love to get him back on here. We'll probably have Dane Brugler at some point after the Beast drops his his draft guide. Uh, anyone that you would want to hear from on the PFF NFL podcast besides JJ Watt, go tag JJ Watt. Let's get him on here. But anyone else you'd want to hear from us, uh, we'll try to get Chris Sims again. We have a good relationship with Chris, even though we make fun of him. It's, it's all in fun, right? Yeah, I mean, crazy rankings. That we defended fun. him yesterday, and then he went out there and put Brian Thomas ahead of Marvin Harrison, and Angering that's just you. I can't. He's angering That's you. It's too far. It's no, we love, too we love far. talking to Chris Sims. We have a great discussion. It was a lot of fun with him last year. Okay. Um, wonder if JT has strong QB draft takes. We should ask him. We had a, we had, there's a mailbag somewhere asking us to get him back on the show. We should get JT back out here yeah. as well. So, yeah, let us know who else 
you want us to have on the show. Uh huh. Is that it for today? Did you? So you gave Alex Lindsay the shout out for the bet, right? Did you name yes. him? Yes. Okay. I uh, um, gave him the shout out for the bet. That's the first bet. So we'll get another running document going. Send us your bets. I told the story last year. We used to have the hashtag vault me way back in the day. Yeah. Hashtag vault me. Good way to, you know, put your, put your stuff out there as far as the draft goes. But email it to us and we'll put a PFF plus subscription on the line. Do the last one as well. That's a good one. The Harbaugh one. Oh, this is Chargers fans hate this one. Yeah. All right. This we, is from Luke Cook. We haven't made enough people mad on the show today. Yeah, we haven't. Given Jim Harbaugh's recent comments of J.J. McCarthy, this was a few weeks ago, J.J. McCarthy being the best player in the draft, although nonsense, I believe this poses an interesting question. What if he's being serious? As such, I believe we are in a world where there's a non-zero chance he would prefer his Michigan guy over Herbert. In turn, this allows us to debate a question we never really get to. What would Justin Herbert fetch on the trade market? I think this would be a fun discussion because as far as I'm aware, an elite quarterback has never been traded or changed teams anywhere close to his prime. Who would be the interested parties, and is there a package big enough that it could be put together given the three years ahead rule of trading draft picks? Yeah, you only have three years of draft picks that you can trade. So you can't do like five first rounders or anything. Right. The NBA, they're given like conditional 2036 firsts <laughs> or whatever. Right. Um, so it's a good question. I think the – would you agree the closest elite quarterback that was traded was Deshaun Watson? Yeah. That's what I was just thinking. That's probably the closest to a – an elite guy in his prime, and obviously he came with some caveats. He came were, with baggage, yeah, plus time, con- off. time off, and the contract, plus a new contract that turned into a ridiculous, fully guaranteed contract. Yeah, I mean, so the, so it's the, really tough to compare. There was a lot of, like, in other words, there were a lot of things bringing his value down. Yeah, though the contract that he signed suggests to me that effectively all of the other stuff didn't really impact his value. Like the fact that they were willing to do that in order to get him suggests to me that they were willing to go wherever it took to make that happen, which means it's not like they looked at this and said, hey, if none of this stuff was there, we would trade this, but but now that there's 23 legal suits on him, we're only going to trade this. You know, we get the discount because of the, the damage and the baggage and the PR nightmare. I think this is actually... I think I think they traded market value for him. So the Deshaun Watson deal is probably as close to the market for this as you're going to get. And let's not let's not forget at the time, you know, take the the off field aside. As a player, Deshaun Watson was coming off of an elite PFF grade for whatever that's worth, elite stats, multiple years of playing really well. He was seen as a borderline elite type of quarterback. Right. And what was that trade? It was... Uh, I was just looking. Here we go. The Texans received a 2000... So a 2022 first, uh, a 2023 first, a 2024 first, a 2023 third, and a 2024 fifth. So three first round picks, a third round, a, a third round pick the following year, and a, fourth, a fifth round pick the year after that. So I think we're talking at least three firsts yes. for Herbert. Which is all you can trade unless you have a fourth val- one somewhere. I think his value is higher. He already has the contract. Here's the other part, right? He's already he already has right. signed. So and it's a better contract than the one Watson. It's a better when you it. trade for someone. Let me get over the cap here. I mean, I think we're talking like three first and two seconds. Yeah. So so all you can trade is three first round picks in terms of the future first round, so unless you have extra firsts within that window, right? Correct. So that's the max, essentially, that a team can trade without going to, you know, second rounds and players is the other thing. All right, so his bonus isn't all that high, right? Because when, when he gets traded, the, the Chargers are on the hook for the, for, the, uh, for the bonus money as part of the dead cap, basically. So, yeah, I think it's I, not – so in other words, the, his cap, you're still paying a guy in the, in the 40s and – 50s right as far as his his base salary goes can i i let me just well, the, no, 24 and 26 24 36 47 and 40 obviously the other ridiculous trades which is what i'm going to start putting this into the category of oh, i didn't read the option bonus yeah that's a lot the ricky williams trade where mike ditka decided to trade his entire draft and something the next year i forget what the next year part was but that's always left out um, but traded his entire draft up for Ricky Williams at like not even number one, but somewhere at the top five, right? Where do they draft him? Three or four? Uh, the other trade to read out in its entirety is 
the Minnesota Vikings trading for Herschel Walker, again, running back in, well, 1990. The re- there's a reason why this isn't happening, first of all. Like, we should just should have nipped it earlier. $129 million in dead cap for the Whatever. Chargers. Whatever. So. If you want it hard enough. It's not, so it's definitely not happening. Um, because, and because that, I was reading the, the bonus stuff improperly. Because that stuff is, hap- because that's so high, the team receiving Herbert wouldn't be paying any of that bonus money. They're talking base salaries of 15, 24, 36, 47, and 40. That is a, an absolute steal. Yeah. This is the, the Goff deal, right? They got the, the Lions got Jared Goff at a mid tier quarterback because the roster is not, the bonuses aren't part I of mean, it. I mean, look at it this way, right? Denver's eating a dead cap hit of 80 something million just to get rid of Russell Wilson. This would be trading him for a, a, the greatest haul in the history of the game and getting J.J. McCarthy. We can't do I don't anything. think you're looking at this the right way. This is not how Jim would look at it. Jim Harbaugh is looking at the upside. You're always negative. This is why we have toxic chat. It's you. You're bringing us down. You're here going, oh, look at the cap hits too it's hard. It's literally we can't impossible do it. to trade him. <laughs> Whatever. It's nothing, nothing's impossible as long as you want it hard enough. This anyway, year or next year. <laughs> the, <laughs> or in 26. The Herschel Walker trade. Yeah. The Minnesota Vikings traded for Herschel Walker their first round pick in 1990, their first round pick in 1991, their first round pick in 1992, their second round pick in 1990, their second round pick in 91, their second round pick in 92, their third round pick in 92, their sixth round pick in 90, uh, and four players. And four players. Yeah to get Herschel Walker and a bunch of weird picks that don't make any sense, like a third and a fifth and a tenth and whatever. Didn't the tenth become Larry Brown, Super Bowl MVP? I don't know. Someone fact check me on that. Maybe. That's funny. It's hard to – it then goes into the players that became – Imagine if you just had some semblance of – No, the tenth rounder became somebody called Pat Newman. If you had some semblance of a data-driven approach back in the early 90s, the, the GMs that you could take advantage of. Yeah. All you needed was a nice Herschel Walker. Vikings apparently got Jake Reed out of this somewhere along the way. One of the picks that they got back turned into Jake Reed. So that worked out. Oh, see? Frankly, if you just traded Jake Reed for Herschel Walker, you'd have done okay. I know, right? <laughs> That's why the multiplayer things are so crazy. Yeah. Sometimes the one draft pick ends up. Of Dallas's, I mean, this yeah. is why the Dallas Cowboys ended up with a dynasty, right? Of their picks, they ended up with Emmett Smith, Russell Maryland, Clayton Holmes, Kevin Smith, Darren Woodson. And that's just, yeah. Like, so yeah. it worked that was- out. That was the Seahawks a couple years ago. They turned one first rounder into five other picks, one of which was DK Metcalf, who's clearly worth a first rounder, and then four other players. Yeah. Right? It's like always. So there you go. Yeah. The Ricky Williams pick, or the Ricky Williams trade, their entire draft, plus the first and third rounder next next year. year. Yeah. For Uh, pick number five overall. In the year 2000, Washington had picks two and three because the Saints were terrible in 99. Yes. And in picks two and three, they had LeVar Arrington and Chris Samuels. Picks two and three. Yeah. Which is awesome. Imagine having imagine the team. We were talking about Arizona. We thought Arizona might be in that boat this year. Yeah, that's what it looks. Twice I mean, in the top five or whatever. That's what the odds said heading into that season was uh, Arizona. We're going to get the number one and the number two overall pick. Yeah. Anyway, this is all just it's just fun. The, the show's over. We're just having fun. We know Herbert's not getting traded. <laughs> we, we got to go back and list these other trades. Um, so I don't I don't see that all happening. Um, if they were able to trade Herbert, if there was no cap restriction like that there's no way that makes sense right you take take jj mccarthy at five and then you have two other first round picks two other seconds or whatever it might be to build that roster around jj and a first contract quarterback you're saying there's no way that makes sense if they were able to do it yeah like if if they were able to get rid of herbert without a 129 million dollar cap hit right is there ever a place where jj mccarthy plus four or five other top draft picks equal the value of what you have in Herbert. I mean, there is. It was just because he's, yeah. you know, it's I like think there is. mystery box, right? J- any quarterback draft well, is a mystery, mystery box. box. But because the haul you're getting is so big. I mean, number one, if, if Jim Harbaugh is coming in, remember, the, the, reason, that, that the, the reason the negative side of J.J. McCarthy's uh, pre-draft profile exists is largely because the offense that Jim Harbaugh was running, right? Right. Like, somebody put out a stat the other day that he attempted, like, 126 passes in the second half last season. Like, he barely threw the ball in the second half at all. They were just running it because they had a lead and they were winning. They were above. You know, they were ahead of most, te- most teams. Right. Yeah. I'm not saying it's because they didn't trust him. I'm just saying they didn't need him to throw the ball at all. His numbers on third down are like crazy, ridiculous, small. You know what I mean? So 
All of this is because Jim Harbaugh is out there running the ball hard, occasionally using a quarterback on third down to move the chains and then keep going. Like if he's looking at this and going, I have one of the most valuable assets in the NFL in Justin Herbert, and I'm not going to use him to that potential. Like I don't need him playing like that. I don't need Justin Herbert to carry this thing. I'm going to run the ball hard. I'm going to have the guy just, you know, he might look at this and say, there's a, there's a surplus value here that I'm not tapping into. Why don't I get rid of that? Get three first-round picks and a bunch of other stuff back and use J.J. I know that he can do it. I wouldn't do it. I mean, I don't think I would either. <laughs> but I'm saying there's a world where Jim Harbaugh thinks it's and, worth and doing. And you didn't want to have the QB discussion. And he just traded away all his re- – or not trade away. I've got to keep saying that. He got rid of all his yeah. receivers. You didn't want to have the QB discussion off the Bucky Brooks tweet. But we had this one instead. All right. I already tweeted through it. The NFL does not have a QB evaluation and development problem. Bucky thinks they do. Yeah, I would not say that they do. (laughs) I will say, just looking through that 1999 NFL draft, that the running back talent drops off hard after Ricky Williams. So, you know, you needed your running back. You had to make something happen. Had to. Didn't they have Deuce McAllister at the time? Probably. Was that before or after? It can't have been before must have been he's after after. yeah Yeah, he's after deuce is not old like three years later though yeah it wasn't a good move i mean you're dropping down to mike cloud in the second round it's getting rough that was uh which draft the 98 draft that i watched somewhat recently there's a lot of good running backs there fred taylor was there and a bunch of others and the the discourse at the main set was like, when's a running back coming off the board? Are you going to trade up and get the running back? What about the running back? What about the right? Like, there's five running backs that are first round grades. When are you going to get this guy? The Cowboys need a running back. It was a <laughs> little different than today. Amos Zeroway in the third. Amos like, Zeroway from uh, West I think we might need to start revisiting what Mike Dicka did. He did He did the responsible he thing. He was right. He needed the scarcity of the running back. Mike position. Dicka was right. That's what we need. Like You should do that on your YouTube channel. Why Mike Dicka was right. Oh, no. Here we go. No, 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 no. Orlando's Gary. Now, that was Denver. That so, doesn't count. Yeah, okay, that doesn't count. Alandis Gary was like Brock Purdy today right. in Shanahan. System running back. Yeah, system, system running back. System running back, back when that was a thing. They all, were, they all had thousands. I actually can't find another running back that was even vaguely useful after Ricky Williams. What about the next year? What about in 2000? Oh, dude, that doesn't count. You can't look into the future. That's madness. you got to deal with the now. All right, are we done? It sounds like it. Very much so. He saw what Fred Taylor did for the Jags in 98 and said, I need that with uh, Ricky. I've seen what you did for other people, and I want that for me. I want that. (laughs) Yes. All right. Somebody make that into a meme. Mike Ditka. (laughs) Mike Ditka. And and you have to just reference Fred Taylor. Lord, I've seen what you did for other people, and I want that for me. There's literally not another good running back in this draft after Ricky Williams. So they nailed it. Mike, Mike is. Oh, wait. Undrafted. Free agent. Aaron Stecker. Stecker. Who also ended up with the Saints, right? Scat back. Stecker. <laughs> Whatever. Scat back. Just a scat back. Give me that crap. In 97, they were debating, can Warwick Dunn handle the, the full, full workload? Well, that's why you and had T.J. Duckett. Number 12 overall. That's why you needed T.J. Duckett there. All right. Fun show here today. Tomorrow, we're going wide receiver rankings. You Don't forget, you get 30% off any PFF annual subscription. 30MDS, 30MDS is your promo code. Uh, send us your bets, NFL Podcast at pff.com. Your bets for the draft, your your bold takes, whatever it might be. Put something up, put some coffee on the line. And we'll put PFF Plus on the line, and uh, you know, see what see what comes through. We got to look at some of last year's bets at Do some we? point too. So they were fun. We had the one that said Will Levis would drop out of the top twenty. He was correct. He was, yeah, nailed it. Probably got nervous when Will Levis was getting number one overall hype the day of the draft, right. <laughs> or number two overall hype to right. Houston, but. Um, ended up working out Mm -hmm. all right thanks everybody for tuning in we'll be here again tomorrow with more pff nfl podcast